Okay, so in this first lecture of the semester, we will be dealing with the questions, what is the Bible and why is it so important to Christians? So the Bible, as we refer to it, connotes something singular. That word, the, usually refers to something in the singular and something unique. But the first point that we want to appreciate is that the Bible is made up of many different books. In the U.S., the phrase, the good book, has come to refer to the Bible as something singular, something that we can commonly refer to as that thing. Uh, we mean the same thing by it. But anyone who has delved into the Bible realizes that we're not only dealing with something singular, a text that is uh, written from beginning to end uh, as a single entity, but a collection of texts. Christians regard the Bible, though, as the word of God, or in Mass, sometimes we say the word of the Lord. And we emphasize this unity with that word, the, the word of God, the good book, the word of the Lord. But we need to also recognize that this unity is a compilation of many different texts formed over a great amount of time, bound into a, a single volume. Taking a step back, the Bible is also a record of a particular people's pursuit of what is ultimate. Uh, questions of meaning, questions of truth, questions of purpose. It's a transgenerational record about the world, ourselves, and our relationship to what is of ultimate significance and to what is true in the deepest sense. It's also a record of what this people takes to be God's own pursuit of them. They're searching for ultimate truth, ultimate meaning, ultimate purpose, but this ultimate meaning, truth, and purpose is also in pursuit of them. God is in some ways the primary actor, the primary character in the book, uh, not only the object of reflection, but also the one that initiates and influences the experience and the records of these experiences in the Bible. The world is a mysterious place, uh, the existence is an amazing, wonderful thing. And a human lifetime is far too short of a time to really explore all of the depths and to find satisfying, complete answers to the questions that we're able to form and that are urgent and they're significant to us. So the Bible is a record that goes back many, many generations and is a way of providing means for those in the present generation to go on this same search, but with the benefit of the past experience of those who have been on that same road and who have discovered things that may be of use to us in our own journey. Uh, a great definition of what the Bible means for Christians appears in the church's uh, document on sacred scripture from the Second Vatican Council. So this is the uh, most recent ecumenical or universal council of the Catholic Church. They released 16 major documents, and one of them is called Dei Verbum, which is Latin for Word of God. And it's all about scripture. It's all about how Catholics are to understand and read scripture. And one of the uh, definitions of the Bible you find there is the words of God written in the words of men. So yes, Catholic Christians and most all Christians, I would say, regard the Bible as the word of God. In this class, though, we're also going to be looking at the ways in which the Bible is a historical or human document as well. These two aspects of the Bible don't come into conflict. They're not mutually exclusive. The Bible is the words of God, it's also the words of men at the same time, fully the words of God, fully the words of men. Remember that. But it's also a collection of multiple books. It's more like a library of texts than a single work written from beginning to end. 
And so that means that we are diff dealing with different authors, different genres, different historical periods, different historical contexts. And it's important to keep this in mind because the particular author, the genre they're writing in, the historical period in which they're writing, what's going on around them, the beliefs and practices of that time, deeply influence the way in which they are trying to express the meaning or insight that they are trying to convey. We're dealing here with about 2000 years of history. The Bible um, is written, uh, it begins to take its written form uh, around 1000 AD, at least its definitive written form. Uh, and then the last book of the Bible is written around 100 AD. But the events that are recorded go back at least 2000 years um, to the time of Abraham. And if you regard the events in Genesis as historical, the uh, account of creation, the Bible takes you all the way back to the beginning of time. But at least as far as concrete history that's located in a particular political and geographic context, it goes back to uh, around uh, 1500 BC uh, to the time of Abraham. So it's written in three languages. Hebrew, the language of the Israelites, Aramaic, which is kind of a dialect of the Israel of the Hebrew language, and Greek. So the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Some of the texts are written in Aramaic as well, brief sections of different books. The entire New Testament, however, is written in Greek, which was the lingua franca or the common language of the Mediterranean in uh, the early centuries of the common era. Christians believe that every biblical passage has two different authors that are at work. Unsurprisingly, there's a human author who wrote down these particular human words in history, but also God, that in some way God is at work behind the human author, using the human author as a kind of instrument or conduit to convey truths that only could be revealed by God. So these many stories in the biblical text coalesce into a single story. This is where the Bible really gets its unity. The Bible is really the story about God's relationship with humanity. From the human perspective, it's about where we came from, uh, where we're going, who we are, what we're for. From the divine perspective, it's about this plan that God has had from the beginning and that he is constantly trying to execute within history to bring his good creation to its fulfillment. All right, now let's break down the different sections of the Bible briefly. So there's two main sections to a Christian Bible, the Hebrew Bible, or what is sometimes called the Old Testament, and the New Testament, which is unique to uh, Christian scriptures. In the Hebrew Bible, we have 46 books in Catholic and Orthodox Bibles. 39 of these books are also recognized as sacred scripture by Jews and Protestants. So in the Jewish Hebrew Bible, you'll find the same 39 books that you will find in Protestant Bibles. However, there are seven books that you find in Catholic Bibles that are not in the Jewish and Protestant versions of the Hebrew scriptures. These include um, books like uh, Sirach, the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, Judith, uh, and uh, these were recognized as sacred scripture, even though they weren't originally written in Hebrew. Uh, they were transcribed into Greek, but are stories and records from the Hebrew people, uh, usually later during the time in which the, uh, the Israelites were under Hellenic influence. But nevertheless, uh, Catholics recognize them to be divinely inspired scriptures uh, before Christ. The three main categories to the Old Testament, which is captured by the Hebrew acronym Tanakh. 
And we'll explain this now. What is Tanakh? What's going on there? Sometimes even in Jewish Bibles, you'll see that the, the entire codex or book of the Bible is called Tanakh. First, you have the law, which in Hebrew is Torah, meaning instruction. The law or the first five books of the Bible uh, are an alternating uh, sequence of narrative, so, so story, what's going on, and then instruction or laws about what to do. Uh, the entire book of Genesis pretty much, uh, with, with relatively few exceptions, is, is narrative in form. Uh, story. Exodus, also mostly narrative, but then you could start to get into the laws or instructions. Uh, the law of the covenant that God gives to Moses, which then takes up uh, the vast majority of the final three books, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is the most important section of scripture for believing, practicing Jews. This is the inspired text that God handed to Moses uh, on Mount Sinai that Moses was charged with recording. However, the Hebrews also recognized as scriptural, to some extent, the books of the prophets. In Hebrew, prophets is Nevi'im, and so this is where you get the N in Tanakh. And the prophets relay the, the story of uh, Israel's struggle to remain faithful to the Lord. This has um, religious aspects relating to idolatry, but it also has social aspects too, uh, and moral aspects of their fidelity to the Lord and to his covenant. The prophets try to, of course, mediate God's will for the people and bring them back to faithful relationship with God. And finally, there are the writings, the ketuvim. This is kind of a general uh, category, a catch-all category for anything that doesn't fall into the law or the prophets. Um, prophets usually go by the name of the particular prophet. So when you see books like Ezekiel, even Daniel, Hosea, Joel, uh, these are books of that particular prophet and his message. The writings though um, capture wisdom literature like Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, um, songs like the, the whole book of Psalms, um, there are other songs not in, in that book as well. Even in Exodus, there's a song of Moses, a song of Miriam. Uh, and then also reflections like didactic stories, books like Job, Jonah, Esther. Uh, these are stories that are told for a particular purpose to make a particular point. So if you combine the T of the Torah, the N of the Nevi'im, the K of Ketuvim, you get this word Tanakh. So those are the three main categories of the Old Testament. The New Testament also has three main categories. Um, it's divided into uh, 27 books. And the first category of those books is historical narrative. So the most important books in the New Testament, and for Christians, the most important books of the Bible really are the four gospels, which relate the life and work, the death and resurrection, of Jesus Christ. So there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll talk more later about why there are four of them and what that means, what that conveys. But they are pretty much stories of the life of Jesus and the significance of who he was and what he did for the world and for the people that he brings into being as the church. The book of Acts, which comes right after the four gospels, is also a historical narrative. It relates uh, the early experience of Jesus's followers who are the church, the uh, community of those who carry Jesus's presence into the world after his resurrection and then his ascension through the power of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus then bestows upon them. And we'll be reading from the book of Acts uh, at the end of the semester. So those are pretty much history, historical narrative, which tells you about what happened uh, in the life of Jesus and in those who followed after him. And then you have a whole group of letters, which are records of early Christian correspondence. Um, most of these letters, letters were written by St. Paul to early Christian churches that he founded. Some are more universal letters, like the letters of John um, and 
the letters of Peter, uh, but they are letters. They were meant to be sent and received by other Christians in uh, the early church in the Eastern Mediterranean. And then finally, you have this one standalone kind of sui generous book, the Revelation of John, sometimes called the Apocalypse of John. And this falls into the genre of apocalyptic. It's very similar to the type of writing that you see in the prophets of the Old Testament, highly symbolic. Uh, it uses vivid imagery to convey insights about uh, the culmination of history and the end of all things. It's a, it's a vision of history in its broadest scope taken from a supernatural perspective. All right, so these are the, all the different types of texts that are in the Bible. What unites them? How do we initially see their relations to each other? The Bible is ultimately, I would say, a story about a people contending with God. The name of this people, Israel, itself means contending with God. Um, so it's, it's about this people's struggle to understand who God is, what God wants, and to remain in faithful relationship to God. Simultaneously, it's also about God choosing and leading this people to himself. So the chosen people were uh, the instrument by which God reveals himself to the world. And all of the Old Testament, and in some ways the New Testament as well, is about God's relationship with his people that he has chosen out of the world to be his special uh, uh, holy instruments for the world's salvation. I'd also want to say that an, another way of understanding the Bible generally is as the story of migration. It's really about a, a migrant people looking for a promised land or a home. It's very much about uh, exile and then return to one's home. So if you take, say, for instance, the story of Adam and Eve, they are exiled from paradise. And the whole story of the Bible pretty much is about their attempts to return to this paradise from which they were exiled. You have the story of Noah, and he is exiled in the sense of uh, being chosen to uh, carry forth creation after the flood. Uh, he has to restore the world to a place that might resemble uh, a human home again. Abraham is called from his home early in his life, uh, or late in his life, really. Uh, but this is the beginning. This is the early part of the story of Israel. He's called from his home to a place that he doesn't know. And God is leading him from this uh, place of contentment to a place of instability in order to lead him to a truer home. Moses uh, is uh, the story of the Exodus, uh, which begins with the people of Israel in exile in Egypt. They're enslaved and Moses leads them back to the promised land, to their home. The books of the kings and the prophets are really about the perennial temptation of Israel to settle uh, in the land in a way that uh, takes the promised land as their definitive home. So to kind of settle for the, the comfort and security of this earthly home, uh, that's mainly the kings. They, they want to establish the security, stability. The prophets are the ones that come and want to lead the people to something higher, to higher promised land. And you can even understand the story of Jesus as the Messiah, as a kind of exile and return. This is more of an exile from sin and death these uh, existential conditions that alienate us from the world and from each other. And in Jesus, these are overcome. And Jesus leads the human race uh, from this condition of uh, exile to uh, the promised land of, of heaven, to the kingdom of heaven. And finally, the church. <clears throat> the story of the New Testament, Acts, and the, the rest of the New Testament. The church is oftentimes called a pilgrim people. And to be a pilgrim means to be on a journey uh, from one's home to a place that's a specific destination. And uh, 
just a nation that usually has something to do with uh, devotion or to one's relationship with God. The church is on its way. It's never at home in the world. It's on pilgrimage to uh, the heavenly kingdom in the next life. All right, some key historical dates that you should know um, for uh, the history that surrounds the Bible. The first is uh, Abraham's migration. It's actually in uh, 1850 BC. So um, almost 2000 years actually before uh, the birth of Jesus, you have Abraham moving from his home in Mesopotamia, Ur of the Chaldeans. So uh, I'll show you that later when we talk about Abraham. Around 1250 BC, so 600 years later, you have Moses leading the promised, uh, the chosen people rather, to the promised land from Egypt. Um, that's usually the date associated with the Exodus. All of these dates are, to some extent, approximations necessarily. We uh, don't have exact records of when these happen, but based on uh, where these other events in the Bible lie, this is usually the, the best guess that scholars have about when these happen. We do, however, have a pretty concrete idea of when the people of Israel were exiled from Jerusalem, from the Promised Land, to Babylon. So the Babylonian Empire comes and uh, conquers Jerusalem and takes the elite to their capital city, um, which is in today where roughly where Baghdad is. And this definitely happens in either 57, 587 or 586 BC. So the date here is, is, is pretty certain based on historical records. Also, the date of Pompey the Great's conquest of Judea, uh, the Hasmonean dynasty uh, secures a period of relative independence for Israel. We'll go through all of this history later, but then um, Israel is taken over again. Maybe another unifying theme is the experience of Israel as a conquered people. You could really tell the story of ancient Near Eastern history uh, through the Bible because Israel is conquered at one point or another by all of the major geopolitical uh, empires. Uh, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Alexander the Great's Greek Empire, and then finally uh, Rome. And then in uh, 0 AD is Jesus's birth. Of course, this is how we base our whole dating system today. Whether you call it CE or AD, it's the same reference point. Jesus's birth as uh, year zero. And around 30, 33 years later, Jesus dies and rises again. So these are the dates that you would want to uh, commit to memory as reference points for understanding where we are in history. So those first two, 1850, 1250, you're dealing with really Bronze Age humanity, uh, which then leads into, um, by uh, Jesus's birth, the, the Iron Age um, and the, the classical period. Um, so people of Israel are existing uh, through all of these different time periods. Oh, and then finally, the last book of the Bible. Uh, St. John's Revelation, about a hundred years after Jesus' birth. Most people place John's Revelation at about 96 AD. All right, so we're dealing with a historical gap here between ourselves and the biblical text. So we need to recognize that and then figure out, well, how do we deal with it? There is this gap between our world and the world of the text. And I love the example that is given in the introductory article, How to Read the Bible where uh, I believe it's uh, uh, Jean-Marie Heisberger says, well, what would an ancient person need to know in order to understand an article in a magazine of today? So somebody arrives in a time machine, wants to read an article in, I don't know, Newsweek or National Geographic. Now, what would you have to explain to them besides the language for them to understand what that article is trying to say? Presumably a lot, right? So if you flip that around, why would we need to know any less about uh, the context of an ancient text in order to understand it? Um, 
the gap here uh, is something that has to be overcome by an understanding of the differences between the time periods in which the respective, uh, which, in which the reader and the text uh, exists. So in order to understand what's going on in these ancient texts, we need to know at least as much as an ancient person would need to know in order to understand the modern texts. It's a useful analogy, I think. So what are these dimensions of the context that we would need to know about? Well, first there's the historical to what was going on at the time, what was the political and social situation? Uh, what is the genre or literary form of this particular text? So is it history? Is it law? Is it poetry? Is it prophecy? What is it trying to convey? Well, in order to know what a text is trying to convey, you need to know well, what type of uh, text is it? What, what sort of uh, mode of communication is going on here? A newspaper article is very different from an instruction manual. To read an instruction manual like a newspaper article or vice versa would lead to great misunderstanding. So you have to understand what sort of mode a text is uh, dealing with. And then finally, there's theological dimensions. So what does the community believe? What does this particular author believe about the world? about God, about the nature of their community. What are, what's in the background here that can help me to understand um, what they're trying to convey in the text that they're writing? All of these three dimensions of context, the uh, historical, the literary, the theological, help to unlock what's, uh, and, and help to bridge this historical gap and unlock its meaning. So fancy term for this is hermeneutics. It's basically just is, is Greek for bridge building. Uh, it's the word that's, that's used to refer to the way in which readers bridge these gaps uh, in order to derive the meaning that was originally intended in the text. So to understand what a biblical passage is saying, we first have to enter into the world in which it's written and only then can we really apply its meaning to our own time and place. There's also a metaphysical gap in play here though. Uh, so uh, Daniel Harrington writes in his article, The Bible and Catholic uh, uh, Life, the Bible is different, which is kind of the understatement of the century. It's a different kind of text. What does he mean by different? Is he just saying like it's significant, it's of uh, particular importance or prominence? in history uh, that is an extraordinary quality. It's the text that's been most copied and most uh, distributed widely in, in the world of today. Well, maybe. Uh, is he just saying, well, it's different in the sense that it's distinctive, strange, it stands out. All of these things are true, but what Father Harrington is really trying to get at here is that there's something unique about the Bible. It's unlike any other human text principally because those who claim it to be revealed or divinely inspired um, think of it as being written not only by human beings, but by God. And we can't make that claim about other texts, well, many other texts anyway, that we have lying around here. For Christians, this is what kind of makes it different or in the sense of unique, uh, that it, it has God as its author as well as other human beings which then leads us to a theological approach to the Bible, which is what we'll be taking in this class. And the point of divergence between a theological and a merely uh, human or intellectual approach to the Bible, we might say, is the question of who is really at work, who is revealing what about whom here? And maybe uh, this will become clear. Uh, if you ask yourself, well, does the Bible really reflect our ideas about who God is? Or is it trying to express divine truths about who we are? So who is the primary reference point here? Uh, if God is at work, are we the ones that determine what God says? Or if God is at work, are we merely the instruments for God to convey uh, truths about himself. Either we invent God or God invents us. 
that's really what the divergence comes down to. Um, either we make God in our own image, or we are made in God's image, and that affects how we read the scriptures. If God is primary, and we have a partial understanding of God, then the scriptures are a way of conveying truths that escape us fully. Uh, think of it this way. What would an, an invention or an artifact think of the inventor's understanding of it? What would an inventor's understanding of an invention or the thing that the inventor made look like to that invention? Now, if God is our own invention, then it's mere, then, then we are the ones in charge. We are the primary ones. God is sort of a product of the human. But if God is primary and we are the product of God's thought and imagination, and if God is also the one trying to convey an idea about himself and who we are in the Bible, then we should expect there to be some gap in understanding. I mean, we don't sit down and try to teach math to a cat, right? So the cat can't really fully understand it, right? We can understand something that the cat can't. In a similar way, God is able to understand something that we can't, but is trying to convey it through human comprehensible means through these texts. So it should be no surprise to us if the Bible can sometimes be puzzling or confounding um, or opaque. If it is what it claims to be, it shouldn't be clearly obvious. It shouldn't just be like reading a, a manual for how to make rice or soup or something. It reflects knowledge of a mind that is entirely different from and higher than our own. So there's something to unlock there if it truly is authored by God. Father Bartholomew proposes a way of reading scripture this way uh, and he uses the traditional term lexio divina, which means divine reading, which is just reading the Bible as if God is speaking to us directly, as if we don't already know what he's going to say, but are receptive to receiving something that we might not fully be able to understand at the moment. The Bible, one of the themes in the Bible itself, but the Bible as a text, as a medium, is constantly trying to pry us from our preconceptions of who God is, to challenge the idea that we, we know what we're talking about when we talk about God. It's always trying to kind of destabilize us and to open us up to what more we could know about this God who is beyond us. The true God, if God is above and beyond us, will always be beyond our comprehension beyond our grasp or control. Uh, we won't ever be able to tame God. So the Bible isn't like a book of magic where we learn how to harness the powers of God and, and use them to our advantage. In reading the Bible, the key is receptivity uh, to the words, to the inspiration and in understanding those words and to where God might be leading us through this interaction. So we, the Bible is not so much about us laying hold on God as God laying hold on us. So for Christians, why is the Bible so special? Well, there are different approaches to this question. Uh, first, it's special in the sense of just being a remarkable historical record, an archive of an ancient people. And if you belong to this people, either to uh, Israel to the Jewish people or to the church, to the Christian community, it, it has a special significance just as the place where the community's heritage can be found and its history. It also has a literary or cultural significance. The Bible is made up of ancient literature uh, that has been formative for pretty much all uh, forms of literature uh, since, particularly in uh, Western culture, and some of the literature is really very uh, beautiful and moving. Uh, you could also take a theological approach to this question, though. The Bible is revelation. So as we mentioned before, it's the one book that has God as its author and not just human beings. 
So this is what revelation basically is. God revealing himself. Father Harrington puts it in this uh, way. God's self-revelation is the communication of the mystery of God to the world. And we already discussed why this would be mystery. He quotes here again, De Verbum, the text on divine revelation. By divine revelation, God wished to manifest and communicate both himself and the eternal decrees of his will concerning the salvation of mankind. So this is the record or the uh, token that we can hold on to uh, that tells us what God wants of us and who God is and what will lead us to um, a place of salvation and fulfillment. And so as Father Bartholomew echoes, the fundamental nature of Holy Scripture is a word of God spoken to his people today, spoken to you and me. So what is the authority of the Bible? Why is it uh, of such um, importance for a Christian life? And here we're back into Father Harrington's article. Christians believe the Bible to be inspired, which means to be breathed by God. This is the uh, etymological meaning of this term, inspiration. Dave Urban says that sacred scripture is the speech of God as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. So its composition is influenced by God himself through inspiration. This uh, inspiration is mediated through history by tradition. So God reveals himself through these texts, but also through the history that those texts relate and the subsequent history by which that record is transmitted through time. So tradition is really uh, the historical vehicle or medium by which God's revelation uh, is passed down or transmitted to the present day. God speaks to people always within a shared history. There are these definitive texts that preserve uh, the history and the record of that history. But there are also people charged with guiding the interpretation of that text, proposing it for understanding, devotion, contemplation, and then giving a teaching or interpretation about what it means. So there's three real modes of revelation, at least for Catholics. There is the sacred scriptures, there is the tradition, and the magisterium, which basically just means the uh, teacher entrusted with the transmission of these uh, sacred writings. These are the channels of revelation, but they flow out of the same divine wellspring in the words of Dei Verbum, the word of God. So the sense in which these three modes of revelation are all united. God wants to reveal himself into the world. He uses texts, he uses history, he uses the teachers, who pass down those texts and relate that history. Uh, and even our present history, our experience is also a mode or medium in which God reveals himself to us. But then you could ask the question, well, why should one trust the Bible? Why should one think that it is uh, a reliable account of what God wants and God's self-revelation? Here we get into the topic of inerrancy. This term, as Father Harrington mentions, just means that the Bible uh, is without error. So how do we understand that? Um, how can the Bible be, uh, what is it, perfect in every way? Well, we should remember this phrase uh, from Dave Berman. It's the words of God expressed in the words of men. So to the extent that God is the author of scripture, God is going to be uh, effectively doing what he wants to do, and he's going to be executing his intentions through this text in a way that will be effective. Um, God is God, and so God doesn't make mistakes, doesn't have errors. So if God is at work in it, there's a sense in which God is doing something and that it will be reliable. The Bible, both fully divine and fully human at the same time, how do we understand this? It has all the limitations of a human artifact, and yet God is at work in it. For Christians, one of the primary ways of understanding this is through the doctrine of the incarnation. In the person of Jesus Christ, Christians believe that you have a fully 100% human being 
who is also fully 100% divine or God. Simultaneously, all the limitations and aspects of human life, but also all the fullness and perfection of God. Well, how can we bring those two together? That's the real, that's the question. If the word is made flesh, can we apply that also to human texts? St. John says that the word is made flesh. Well, could we also say that the word is made text? Can God dwell within uh, these scriptures? Well, Dave Verbum writes that the books of the Bible firmly, faithfully, and without error teach that truth which God, for the sake of our salvation, wished to see confided to the sacred scriptures. So it isn't inerrant or perfect in every way possible. It's rather a sound and sure guide to salvation for the sake of our salvation. So it's not claiming to be some sort of perfect scientific report or record. It's not even claiming to be a uh, perfect historical account of every detail of what happened. It's not a perfect practical manual like an you know, auto repair manual. Uh, it is a reliable guide to human salvation. The Bible's inerrancy pertains primarily and exclusively to human salvation. It's leading us somewhere to our ultimate fulfillment. That's why I say in one of my epigrams, your word is a lamp into my feet. It's showing us where to go um, spiritually in terms of the broadest questions that we have as human beings. And so the Bible is considered canonical. The Bible is a, a canon. Well, what does that mean? This is an ancient Greek word that means reed or measuring rod, and, and it just refers to a definitive reference point. Uh, this reed was sort of the measuring stick that sort of indicated a unit of measurement in the ancient world. And so the Bible is a definitive collection of inspired texts determined by the believing community over time. So there is something definitive about it, and we measure things by it. Uh, it's also a norm or rule that then gives shape to the faith and common life of the believing community. So to say um, the Bible is canonical is just to say that it is made up of a definitive group of texts that the community agrees are revealed. And if a text is in the canon, it's divinely inspired, and that's why it's determined to be canonical or a definitive uh, reference point for our lives and for God's will for us. All right, we should say something about the historical development of the Bible over time. Um, the Bible is historical. It's evolved over the course of uh, 2,000 years, at least historically speaking. So in that time, uh, even before it was made into a text, you have an oral tradition by which the people passed down by word of mouth, what happened, their experience, and how they perceived God to be at work. And it's only after that oral tradition that these things are written down in text. But then that text itself is transmitted, translated often into different languages, sometimes edited. And then the community has the task of determining, well, which of these texts that our records of our oral tradition are truly and definitively God revealing himself, which are divinely inspired. The Christian claim that the Bible uh, is, is revelation is bound up with the idea that, well, God is at work through this whole process. It isn't just with a scribe writing down words mechanically as if he's possessed or something. God is at work in the history that's then related through oral tradition, which is then written down and then transmitted, translated, edited, and then the community itself comes to a decision about the status of this particular record, this text. And God is guiding that process at every point. Even the process of reading a canonical scripture, God must be at work in order to unlock the meaning uh, for each reader. So God's there at every step. And I love Bar Father Bartholomew's analogy of the, the winged victory of Samothrace, which is in the Louvre in, in Paris. It's an ancient Greek statue of uh, Nike, the uh, goddess of victory. Uh, and it comes down to us now um, as headless, 
uh, it doesn't have, uh, and didn't have either arm actually. I think they restored one of the arms, but um, it means something to us precisely in the form in which it appears to us. It would look very different if we tried to restore it to what we thought it might be its original state. The fact that it is the way it is, that it's come down to us as it is, is part of its meaning. The statue is what it is because of the effects of its history. Similarly with scripture, these change over time, but they come to us precisely as God intended them to come to us. And so their meaning is bound up with all that history that uh, it's lived through, its changes over time. And this is how Father Bartholomew puts it in his preface. The Bible is heir to a thousand transformations some books have been lost, others considerably altered. Centuries overlap, voices intermingle. Yet in this precise form, it is for us the word of God. The Holy Spirit has willed to give it to us in this state. And so the Bible is, in a sense, brought to maturity over time through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All right, that's it for today. I look forward to seeing you in class.